Brilliant. Thanks, James. Thanks very much, everyone, for um, getting through. Yeah, that chunk of reading. We missed the bit out in the middle, which is basically where the servant just tells the family everything that just happened all over again. Uh, so there you are. We've read it all. Brilliant. Let's pray, shall we, as we begin. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you that you have things to say to us today, to us personally, in our lives. And we pray, Father, you do that. And you show us how faithful you are to us. And we trust you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's the, um, it's the Queen's Platinum Jubilee this year, isn't it? Looking forward to it. Uh, I don't know if you've got plans for it. Um, the Grace Church Committee have been talking about this, actually. And we thought, you know, should we organise a big event? Should we do something really big? And then we actually decided, let's not do that. Let's encourage us, the church family, to do our own little events in our own neighbourhoods and actually build relationships with our neighbours, uh, relationships that might give us opportunities to share the good news of Jesus with people who are actually close to us in our lives. So there we are, that's what we're encouraging you to do. Organise your own event, invite friends, invite neighbours, do that kind of thing. I wonder how you feel about that. I wonder how you feel about doing that. I wonder if you believe that God can work through you. Maybe you can think back to a time in your life when you kind of, you kind of did think that, you thought God could work through you. Um, I always think of um, camp, actually. We used to do these um, camps for young people, um, uh, ventures camps, they're called. And like, all week long, we'd be doing absolutely everything we could to help these young people hear about Jesus. And then after like an exhausting day, you'd finally get them to bed and you'd finally just about get them quiet. And then what would you do? You'd start praying for them. Like, isn't that crazy? How hard did we work for these young people? But we really, really thought God could work in these young people through us. So how's your confidence now that God can work through you? How's my confidence God can work through me? I think that is the focus of this passage. It's not primarily about marriage, this passage, actually. It's not primarily about finding love. It's about a problem, and that problem is that Abraham is old, and he's going to die soon. So what's going to happen to God's promises? God's made these huge promises to Abraham to build his family. Can God keep these promises? And for us, I guess the question is, can God keep these promises for us too? Because God has promised an uncountable number of people with him forever, for all eternity, in his family. Is he going to do it? Will he do it? Will he do it here in Cowley? Will he do it even through us? Well, we're going to see two things today. We're going to see the Lord will grow his family by his steadfast love. And secondly, the Lord will grow his family by our steadfast love. That's quite a surprise, isn't it? That's what we're going to see today. So, first of all, uh, Abraham, well, we're going to think, yeah, the Lord will grow his family by his steadfast love, first of all, okay. Uh, Abraham, this is where Abraham is, right at the beginning of chapter 24. Abraham was now very old, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. So, uh, the Lord has begun to keep his promises to Abraham of being blessed, hasn't he? He does have a son. And he is wealthy. He's wealthy enough to have 10 camels. Pretty wealthy. But he hasn't got what God promised, really, has he? He hasn't got the big nation that God promised. He hasn't got the vast land that God promised. He hasn't become a blessing to all nations. So are those promises going to just die with Abraham? The answer is no. No. Absolutely not. As we read the very last verse that we read, chapter 25, after Abraham's death, God blessed his son, Isaac. So that the promise is going to continue to the next generation. The Lord is going to do it. He's going to grow his family. And it's almost ridiculous how he keeps his promises. It's almost like throwing a pack of cards in the air and trying to catch one, you might say, Nathan, isn't it? It's almost impossible the way he does it. He does it purely by steadfast love. That's the only way he does it. So, Abraham sends his servant off on this 
520 mile journey. Whoa, that's crazy. 21 days it probably took this journey. Wow. And the servant is kind of thinking, this is impossible, isn't he? And you can't really blame him. He says, you know, even if I find one of your family, Abraham, she's never going to come with me. Why would she come with me? That's crazy. But he goes. He goes. And he comes to this town of Nahor, and he arrives at this well, and he prays. He prays, Lord, God of my master Abraham, make me successful today and show kindness to my master Abraham. Do you see the word kindness there? Kindness, that is the word hesed, steadfast love, covenant love, the love that the servant knows God has promised Abraham. He knows he's promised it, and it, the question is, is God gonna show that love? Is God gonna show that love beyond Abraham to build his family? It's impossible, isn't it? No, it's not. Before he'd even finished praying, it doesn't say that, before he had finished praying, Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother, Nahor. Isn't that amazing? What a coincidence. And I love that. Before he had finished praying. Isn't that great? What an answer to prayer. The Lord, he, he answers this prayer. I mean, what are the chances of Isaac's cousin's daughter, I think that's right, Isaac's cousin's daughter, just happening to be at the well at the moment that the servant prays that prayer? Unbelievably impossible, right? But the Lord is providing. And the servant, he must be absolutely gobsmacked as, as Rebecca, or she, she gives him the water that he asks for, and then, he, then she does exactly what he prayed she would do. She offers water for his camels, his 10 camels, bear in mind, 10 camels. Do you know how much water camels drink? Quite a lot of water. That's crazy, that's what she does. Isn't it amazing? And uh, that's why the chapter is so long, because we're seeing the servant pray this thing to God, massively complicated, then Rebecca does this thing, massively complicated, and then the servant tells the whole family that she's done it, and it's massively complicated. And the point is, it's exactly God at work, so precisely, in such an impossible way. So what's the lesson? It's not so much about how do you get guidance, as in, you know, pray to God for a sign. It's not so much that, it's this. Then the man bowed down and worshipped the Lord, saying, Praise be to the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not abandoned his kindness and faithfulness to my master. Kindness, do you see? Steadfast love, such incredible covenant love. God is making his provision to grow Abraham's family, just as, he, just as he promised, against all the odds. It's impossible, but he does it. And friends, that is what God is doing today. If we are trusting in Jesus, we are the evidence that God is doing this. Even in this generation, God is growing his family, and it's impossible, but he's doing it. Isn't it wonderful? He is. Fast forward 2,000 years after this point of Abraham. Fast forward 2,000 years. There's another well, isn't there? We looked at it not so long ago. And Jesus travels to it in a distant land, a distant country. And there's a woman at the well, isn't there? He just happens to find her. Isn't that a coincidence? And Jesus basically acts out exactly what the servant does here, pretty much. She's not one of Abraham's family. She is a foreigner. She's not a virgin. She is an immoral woman. She offers Jesus water, and he offers her living water, eternal life, offered to a total outsider, someone who is so far away from God. In every way, Jesus offers her Come and be part of the family. Come and be part of Abraham's family. Isn't it wonderful? Do you see God's sheer kindness, his covenant love, his steadfast love to anybody? And it seems impossible, doesn't it? God can do this. But it is possible 
through Jesus to anybody, anyone who will accept it. Maybe you never realised it's possible for you that God could include someone like you in his family. Maybe, maybe you know you've, because of your background or the way you've lived your life, you've been, you've been far away from God and you've turned far away from him in so many ways. Well, me too. And it's, it's called sin. But God grows his family by sheer kindness. It's undeserved. It is, it is impossible. But he does it through Jesus. He can include you if you'll accept his offer. Because on that first Palm Sunday, today is Palm Sunday, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a mission to save people like you and people like me by dying for our sins and rising again so we can be part of the family. It's such good news. And what God is offering you is exactly what you want. It is, it is actually marriage, really. You know, we're talking about marriage here with uh, Isaac and, and Rebecca. Well, there's a really beautiful Hollywood moment, isn't there? I don't know if you noticed how Hollywood and beautiful it was. Uh, as, as Isaac looked up, uh, he, he saw the camels approaching and Rebecca saw it on two lines. Rebecca also looked up and saw Isaac and their gazes meet. It's beautiful, isn't it? It is beautiful. But, but the point is not kind of the beauty of, of their romance. The point is the beauty of God's provision here. Like the orchestra are playing and they get married and everything. And, but the point is, it's showing God's security that he is offering. His promises are sure and secure. God is providing the way to grow his family, just like he promised to Abraham by steadfast love. And that is what we crave. You know, human love is, is great and it's wonderful, but it's always imperfect. What we crave is God himself with us and committed to us for all eternity. What we crave is security from the Lord. We crave covenant love and we can have it through Jesus. And Jason Roach's book that I keep banging on about, I'd love you to read it, it's only a fiver, you can do it by bank transfer, or by cash, by the way. Um, it's great uh, because he says the main story of the Bible is marriage. Isn't that funny? The main story of the Bible is marriage. Jason says God is a lover. Isn't that great? I think he's right. Absolutely. It's a relationship with God that was broken, Genesis chapter 3, but by revelation is restored in a marriage. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Read the book, it's great. Uh, that is the hope that God is calling to us, uh, calling us to. He's even calling you to it. It's wonderful. And many of us know that. Many of us know that for ourselves and praise God for that. But in practice, many of us don't really believe it for others, do we? That the Lord actually is doing that, that he's actually calling people to himself, that he's actually going to grow his family by steadfast love. And because of that, we hardly mention our faith at the school gate. We don't really believe our neighbours are going to be interested in what we do on a Sunday morning. And the thought of kind of inviting them to an Easter service or a Jubilee celebration, we kind of think, yeah, that's not going to work. A bit scary, maybe a bit pointless. But you see, the Lord grows his family in what seems like impossible ways, doesn't he? And he does it by sheer steadfast love. Kindness, not deserved, but kindness. I've mentioned before, I think, um, this couple who uh, we had in London at our church there, who, who eventually did Christianity Explored after months of saying, do you want to do Christianity Explored? Months and months of it. Eventually they came and said to me, we'd really like to do Christianity Explored. I was like, okay. Uh, so we did it. And um, the, the, the wife was really, really opposed to the gospel and to everything we were teaching. And it was really tense. I'd, I'd go to the house and I'd be dreading it. And, uh, and it would be really confrontational whenever we did it. And I remember asking people to pray. And I used the words, humanly speaking, it is absolutely impossible that she is going to come to faith. Please pray. 
And then one day, one, one week, when we met together, I turned up and she was just a bit different. It's really odd. And she still had lots of questions, but during that session, she said, do you know what? I think I believe this. And I said to her, what do you mean? What do you believe? And she said, all of it. I was like, what? Okay, amazing. Uh, and they're still there now. We delight in hearing about this couple. They're stuck in at that church. It's a wonderful thing. And it seemed so impossible. But you see, the Lord did it by sheer kindness, undeserved, steadfast love. He grows his family because he's promised he will, and he does. It's just like Rebecca, just impossibly coming into the family and creating the family as, as they go on. So does that mean if God's just going to do it, God's just going to do it whatever, does that mean we just don't do anything? Does it mean that? Absolutely not. So first of all, the Lord will grow his family by his steadfast love. And secondly, the Lord will grow his family by our steadfast love. And we see this in Abraham. We see it in the servant. We see it in Rebecca. They didn't do nothing. They did something. What did they do? Let's have a think. Uh, Abraham, first of all. Now, he could have compromised, couldn't he? Uh, he could have just said, oh, just let Isaac have a wife from the Canaanites. That'd be nice and easy. Plenty of them around. Very, very easy. Or he could have said, I'll tell you what, let's just send Isaac off to find a wife in my home country. Could, could have done that as well. But he didn't do that. Why didn't he do that? Because he believed God's promises. And he wasn't trying to take shortcuts anymore. He didn't want his family influenced by the Canaanites. He didn't want his family influenced by their fake gods. He didn't want his family to end up destroyed with the Canaanites eventually for their sin. And Abraham knew the land was promised to him and his family. And he doesn't want his family leaving the land even if it's to find a wife. No, he's going to trust God's promises and they're going to stay in the land. So he sends his servant off. You see, God built his family through Abraham because of Abraham's steadfast love. Do you see that? For God. How Abraham's grown, hasn't he, over time. He is now totally committed to God. And he absolutely refuses to compromise on God's way. Whatever. He just refuses to compromise. What, what about us? What about us? Can God use us because we're absolutely committed to him? Now, it may well be on marriage, you know, committing to God's way of only marrying a fellow believer, if we're a believer. Are we absolutely committed to that? That is the best way not to drift in your faith, isn't it? And be influenced wrongly and end up being ineffective for God. That is also the best way to raise up children who are believers, who will be influenced, not with conflicting influences, but with one influence to trust in Jesus. It might be, might be marriage, but it could be in all areas of life. Will we trust that living God's way actually is best and we will be more fruitful for God if we do, even if our culture disagrees? Maybe there is an area of your life where you are tempted to compromise and to take a shortcut. The way to be fruitful for God is to be absolutely committed to him. That's Abraham. Well, then there's the servant. Then there's the servant. God used the servant because the servant had steadfast love for God too, didn't he? He actually did do something. He went and he prayed. He really prayed. I wonder if we're doing that. I wonder if we're actually praying for God to grow his family through us. Do you ever pray that? In my experience, uh, when you do do that, when I remember to do that, when I pray, you know, God, please give me an opportunity to share the good news of Jesus. Do you know what? He actually does do it. It is quite remarkable. Now, it's not necessarily in like the same way as the servant, you know, God, please give me a woman who's going to come with some water and do this and do that. It's not kind of, you know, that specific necessarily, you know, like specific miraculous guidance. Actually, in any case, if you think about it, the servant was praying for seeing God's provision in everyday life, wasn't he? It's pretty, pretty everyday, you know, the well, it's pretty an everyday thing. Um, and that would be a great prayer to pray, wouldn't it? Lord, please let me see 
in everyday life, in my normal life, an opportunity. Someone who is ready to hear the good news of Jesus. Not like a sign from the sky, but open my eyes to an actual opportunity in my life. And then also to hold lightly to thinking that we are certain what God's will is for this particular thing. Do you know what I mean? Even the servant actually held quite lightly to it. Uh, he, he, he goes through the whole thing with the family. And then in verse 49, he says, but, you know, basically, uh, if, if you don't want to let Rebecca come, then just tell me and I'll, I'll go, basically. <laughs> he, kind of like, he, he trusts God's, God's guidance, but he doesn't think that he knows for sure what God's will is until he sees it played out in real life. That's the kind of good secondary application, actually, for marriage, isn't it? You know, guidance in relationships isn't so much, you know, God, please show me a sign from the sky about whether I'm going to be single or whether I'm going to be married, but more, Father, if I should marry, please show me in everyday life someone who is godly and who I could serve God with, as Rebecca clearly was, but even then to hold lightly to thinking, well, I know God's plan for me and I know God's plan for that person and that kind of thing, just to hold lightly to that and see how God plays it out in everyday life. That's a side application. The main application is this. God can use people like us to build his family through our steadfast love for God. People who are committed to God's way, Abraham, people who are praying for opportunities, the servant. And then what about Rebecca? What about Rebecca? What about Rebecca's steadfast love? Well, Rebecca is pretty amazing, actually. You see at the well kind of how kind she is. She's a godly lady. She kind of gives water to all these servants. You see how kind she is in comparison to her family and her, her money-grabbing brother. Her money-grabbing brother seems very interested in the, the jewellery, but not very interested when the servant says, right, we're off now. Uh, so uh, he doesn't seem particularly godly. You see how godly she is in comparison to her family. But most of all, you see her love in three words that she says that show her heart and it's these i will go she said that is incredible isn't it how incredible to leave your country and your security to marry a man you've never even met H how do you do that how does rebecca do that she does that because she trusts god's promises to abraham and she wants to be part of God's promises to Abraham. And brothers and sisters, that is how God can use us to grow his family. Because we believe his promises. Because we believe his promises that Jesus really is growing a huge eternal family, Abraham's family. And Easter really reminds us that we can believe these promises. Jesus, he, he seeks out outsiders by sheer kindness, like the woman at the well. It seemed impossible, didn't it? He seeks out you, even though you're far from God and I'm far from God. Seems impossible, but he did it. He arrived in Jerusalem, Palm Sunday, on that donkey. He went to the cross to die for our sins. He rose again. He ascended to heaven. God is absolutely committed to growing his family, isn't he? Absolutely. And that means we can do what seems like impossible things. We can, we can step out and do slightly uncomfortable things. Maybe nowhere near as uncomfortable as Rebecca. We can do that expecting that he will be keeping his promises. He will do, even in impossible ways. Even now, even here in Cowley, he will be. Maybe through an invitation to an Easter service. Maybe through some kind of Platinum Jubilee event. Who knows? If you can remember a time when you thought God could use you, if you can remember a time, well, brothers and sisters, that time is still now. It's not changed. And the reason is because you know the love of Jesus. You know God's steadfast love in Jesus. And he has grown that steadfast love in you, just like he did for Abraham, just like he did for the servant, just like he did for Rebecca. And so you know 
the Lord will grow his family by his steadfast love and he'll grow his family by your steadfast love. Let's pray, shall we? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you that we know your steadfast love. You've made it so clear in your provision to Abraham, in your provision of building his family through Isaac and Rebecca, in how impossible that seemed and yet you kept it, in so many impossible things you did in Genesis that we've seen. And, of course, mostly in the impossible thing you've done through Jesus, him coming to rescue us, to die for our sins, to rise again. Father, we know your steadfast love. Thank you so much for it. And thank you, Father, we can trust that you are building your family and you will build your family because you're absolutely committed to your promises. Please help us trust you, Father. And please, because you've worked that same love in us in response to your love, because you've done that, please, Lord, lead us to be committed to your ways, to pray for your family to grow, and to do sometimes uncomfortable things, trusting your promises. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing. Can I sing